الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيدي ولدي آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم العجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فلذلك فدع واستقم كما أمرت ولا تتبع أهواءهم وقل آمنت بما أنزل الله من كتاب وأمرت لأعدل بينكم الله ربنا وربكم لنا أعمالنا ولكم أعمالكم لا حجة بيننا وبينكم الله يجمع بيننا وإليه المصير رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين In today's khutbah, I'm hoping to conclude uh, a series of khutbah that I started some time ago. I was traveling in between. I was in New York and New Jersey for some time. So I didn't continue that series, but I wanted to bring that to a conclusion, hopefully today, if not, then by next week. And so I want to give, because it's been a while, give a little bit of a recap, and then inshallah, get to the subject matter that I hope to address today. So I spoke about uh, a, a couple of uh, khutbahs ago, maybe over a month ago, I spoke about how Allah describes that when there are people who believe and those who came before us that believed and they were knowledgeable in their religion, when they started falling into lots of disagreements with each other, Allah commented on why did they do that? Why were knowledgeable people fighting each other? Why were people of knowledge of the previous scripture falling into disagreements, factions, groups, and are, were at odds against each other? Then he described one of the core reasons for which that happened. And I talked then about the difference between legitimate differences, because you and I can interpret something differently. We can analyze something differently. We have madahib in our, our religion. We have schools of thought in our religion based on different kinds of thought processes, right? So you can look at the same thing and analyze it in different ways. But that did not mean that they were divided among each other. That just mean, meant they had healthy disagreements among each other and they had intellectual dis debates and discussions among each other. That's not the subject that Allah is talking about. What he's talking about is when people were so divided that because of some intellectual disagreement, some dis you know, change in interpretation or some varying interpretation, people started hating each other, people started calling each other disbelievers, people started basically going at ideological or even in some cases physical war against each other because of their religious perspectives, because of their differences of, of opinion among themselves. And this was being done by, by people that were supposedly, you know, carriers, torchbearers of the religion, they're knowledgeable, and yet they became warmongers in the name of religion within the ummah, within what was given to them. And Allah describes that they did this baghiyan baynahum because of an urge they had inside of themselves to dominate and overcome each other, because they weren't satisfied with the growth that they had, because they wanted more control and more, more of the population following them instead of somebody else. You can think of it, because I come from business school, you can think of it in terms of market share. They were, they were you know, afraid that their market share is being taken away by the competition, so let's annihilate the competition by going after them. Right. So they turned... The, the religious, the, the deen of Allah and the discourse about the religion of Allah into basically a business and into a means of getting political, social, and economic power. So that's what we've talked about before. And then we talked about a consequence of that in that ayah, because it's, it's just one ayah. 
in Surah Al-Shura. But it describes a lot of history and a lot of principles of history that still they're still alive today. And that what that principle was when people of knowledge that know the deen do this, when enough of them do this, then the next generation that inherits the religion from them and inherits the book from them, Allah says, لَفِي شَكِّمْ مِنْهُ مُرِيبٍ وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُورِثُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ لَفِي شَكِّمْ مِنْهُ مُرِيبٍ That those who inherited the book much after them, that they fell into doubt about it, a disturbing doubt. How can this religion be true when these people are always fighting? They're always arguing with each other. I'm not, you know, my, my th this just seems like a bunch of angry people that hate each other. And this is just a means of creating war in the world and, and crisis and conflict in the world. Religion is, they say the religion is about peace, but look at the reality. All it is is about fighting. That's all they ever do. So the next generation started doubting whether the religion itself is valid or not. And then the, that doubt became so severe that murib, that it not only was a doubt, they were in disturbing doubt themselves, they started putting others in doubt. They started putting, murib is actually muta'addi. So they, they, so they, they put it, they, when people would talk to them, others would talk to them, others that don't have a crisis of faith would now get a crisis of faith just by talking to them. So the next generation was heading more and more and more towards what we call nowadays agnosticism. Right? I'm not sure what is and what isn't right. I'm not sure about anything. So the, the religion itself becomes doubt. And it's not just that you're in doubt yourself. You love spreading that doubt to others. You, be, you become that. And so the Prophet ﷺ was told that this is what happened before you. This is what happened before you. And then that, in that encapsulating ayah, وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمِ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ وَلَوْ لَا كَلِمَةٌ سَبَقَتْ مِنْ رَبِّكَ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى لَقُضِّيَ بَيْنَهُمْ so, despite all of this, what, what are we learning from that? Well, the elder generation, the knowledgeable generation is too busy fighting for power. And the younger generation is in doubt about the religion altogether. Lost cause. Now, in despite all of that, you would imagine the Prophet is being told you have a pretty tough job ahead of you. And I want to put that in perspective today. That's probably the most important part of today's discussion is putting this in perspective. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is first sent to Makkah. And then when things get too intense and basically his life is threatened, then Allah opens the door for him to go to Medina. In Makkah, he is at odds against the mushrikun, idol worshippers. And the mushrikun are not going to let the majority of them, especially the powerful among them, even though secretly they know Islam is true, they're not going to accept it. And the reason they won't accept it, Allah also describes in the Quran. In a previous khutbah in New York, I mentioned it. I'm referring to it quickly. It's not just that they love the idols or they, they are really convinced of their religion or they really want to hold on to their ancestral legacy. It's none of these things. Actually, these are all secondary things. The primary objective they have is because they control the Kaaba and because the idols are being kept at the Kaaba, all the tribes in the region respect them because all of their tribes are over here. All, all of their idols are over here. And so nobody attacks them because they are custodians of everybody else's false god. So when they travel out in the desert, they don't get robbed. Why? Because they have insurance. What's their insurance? All these other tribes, their gods are being held at the Kaaba. So when the Prophet ﷺ comes and says, let's do away with shirk, uh, what do you mean, do we chick? If we destroy these idols, we're going to make enemies with every tribe. And we're fair game. Then they're going to attack us on the road. All the security, prosperity, all the tourism industry, the shirk tourism industry that we enjoy, you're trying to destroy that entire industry with just la ilaha illallah? Who are you? There's no way we're giving that up. And you and I know that politicians can talk about what's best for the country or our history or our nation or patriotism and all that stuff. They all say the same things. But at the end of the day, behind the scenes, the only thing they're trying to hold on to is money and power. That's it. That's all it is. That's actually their real God. Right. So the, 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 the true God of the leaders of Quraysh is the same. The, their actual God is the same as the God of corrupt policy, politicians, and people who use anything in the name of nation. They, it's the same old gods, money and power. And add, if you want to add another one, status, money, power, and status. That's it. There's no, there's no, that's the actual idols, right? For common people, they might think the idols are these statues in front of them. They don't care about those statues. Even when they were mushrikun, Allah says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَعُونَ They show off when they pray. They're not even sincere in their shirk. <laughs> right? They're not even sincere in that. So 
what, what am I getting at? Let's get to the point. The Prophet ﷺ is being told the mushrikun are not going to let go of their shirk. Have they made up their minds? They're, they're too adamant. And two-thirds of the Qur'an, the powerful word of Allah has re been revealed to them. Over a decade, they've heard the word of Allah. Every reason they had to be convinced has already been given. And yet, despite being convinced, they will not accept. Then Allah opens the door to Medina. Now when Allah opens the door to Medina, in Medina there's a contingency of Jews. And there's also some influence of the Christians. And we're going to start interacting. The Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims are going to come into contact with Jews and Christians. And these people are not like the mushrikun. There's more potential here because they know of the same people the Quran is talking about. They know about Ibrahim. They know about Nuh ﷺ. They know about Adam ﷺ. They know about Musa ﷺ. They have respect for them. They revere them. Right? So we have differences. But among we have a lot more in common between them than the people who worship Lat, Manat, and Uzza. You have a lot more in common with them. There's, that's why Allah says, Ta'alu ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum. Come to a common word between you and ourselves. So the, even the Sahaba started, the Muslims started thinking, we have a better chance of them accepting this call. Because they're going to see that it's a confirmation of their own scripture. It's already mentioned in their own books. They're not going to reject us outright that, like the mushrikun did. It's, it's, it's hard for them. It's harder for them. Kabura ala al mushrikina ma tad'uhum ilayhi. This is the ayah before. Kabura ala al mushrikina ma tad'uhum ilayhi. It's really hard for the mushrikin what you're calling them to. It's really tough for them. But on the other side, for the for the, the people of the book, there's a better chance. And in Baqarah, Allah said, Afatatma'una an yu'minu lakum. Are you hopeful that they're just going to accept what you're saying? Waqad kana fariqum minhum yasma'una kalam Allah. Thumma yuharifunahum min ba'di ma aqaluhu wa hum ya'lamun. They used to hear the word of Allah. And they changed it deliberately even after they understood it. So now Allah is pointing out their corruption. Now in, this, in these couple of ayat, what has Allah done? In, in the first of these ayat, this is ayah number, uh, number 12. He told the Prophet ﷺ that the mushrikeen are a hard sell. They're not going to accept what you're saying. Majority of them won't accept. Then the next ayah, he says, the knowledgeable of the people of the book that you're hoping because they know their scripture, they'll find the common ground between you and the Quran and they'll accept the message of Allah. No, because they were knowledgeable, they used their knowledge as a means of what's, what again? Money and power. The same thing Mushrikun were doing. They're doing the same thing. They're just as corrupt. It's actually at the core the same problem. And then the next generation is about doubt about religion altogether. Now, obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And then the Prophet is told, now what should you do? Now that you've been made aware of all these obstacles. Now, put this in perspective. What is the Prophet ﷺ actually being told? He's being told, see, the, the Prophet ﷺ was sent to the children of Ibrahim ﷺ. He was sent on the one hand to the mushrikun, who are the children of Ibrahim ﷺ from that line, Ismail ﷺ. And on the other hand, of course, when he went, goes to Medina, there's interaction with the Jews and the Christians. You can attribute that to the children of Israel and that line, all the way ending with Isa ﷺ, right? So it's basically his entire audience is either the Banu Ismail in one sense or Banu Israel in the other sense, right? So those are the children of Abraham that he's dealing with, either the mushrikun or the people of the book. And what did Allah say in these two ayat? The mushrikun for the most part don't want to hear what you're saying because you're threatening their power and money and status. And then on the other side, the people of the book don't want to hear what you're saying because you're threatening their power and money and status. <laughs> so... Here you have Allah's Messenger who's been sent to these two audiences because Allah wants them to be guided and then Allah sent him here and then Allah is telling him, by the way, this is an impossible cell and that's an impossible cell. They're not interested. Most of them are not interested. And they know and they still won't listen to you. You know, it's one thing that maybe if I can convince them, they will accept, right? So my hope is I can what? Convince them. Allah says, no, no, no. They're already convinced. They still won't accept. Now what do I do? What's my mission now? If you, you, Allah Himself has revealed that the audiences for the most part are impossible. Now what to do? And so we typically, we, we think about this. We think about when you're, you've been given a job, you've been given a mission, there are obstacles in front of you. There are challenges. And you've been given a motivational speech. And the motivational speech is why, despite all of these challenges, march forward. Despite all of these challenges, meaning even though there are obstacles in your path, plow through them, go through the, you know, go through these obstacles, overcome. Allah doesn't say that. 
in the, this ayah that I really wanted to talk to you about today, probably continue into the next week. Allah doesn't say that. He says, فَلِي ذَلِكَ فَدْعُوا Not فَعَلَى ذَلِكَ فَعَلَى الرَّغْمِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ No, despite all of that. No, he didn't say that. He said, فَلِي ذَلِكَ لَا مِسَّبَبِيَةً تَعْلِيلِيَةً This means, and because of these obstacles, you must call. Because of them. The title of this khutbah was not despite, but because, but because of. This is how I, I think of it. What is what Allah telling His Messenger them? You were sent, you were given this task, because no one else can face these challenges. And because these challenges are so massive, only you are qualified to stand against these challenges. And it is because of that you have to invite. Anyone else, when you give them the list of obstacles, they'll say, these are the reasons for me to quit. Allah's Messenger is being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because of these obstacles, you must stand and invite. Because of them. In fact, you've been given these list of problems because no one else could have done this job except you. And by extension, by extension, because we are the ambassadors of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we were supposed to understand this obstacle and understand what Allah told His Messenger, so we would understand that not this. We don't look at these challenges and say because of them we can't move forward. Actually, because of these challenges, we were chosen to be the Ummah. Because of these challenges, I was chosen to be Muslim. And because of these challenges, and because of my loyalty to my Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I must invite. Fadru, falidalika, fadru. Because of that, invite. Now let's be realistic about that. And at least I'll give you some nuggets today for what does this mean to, to invite? What is the Prophet ﷺ inviting them to? The Prophet ﷺ is, is inviting them to the word of Allah. He's inviting them to the Qur'an. The Qur'an is coming to him and he's inviting them to listen to what Allah is saying. That's basically what it is. He's inviting them to listen to what Allah is saying. And I told you already, these corrupt politicians in Mecca, they're listening in one ear, out the other. They don't want to hear it. The knowledgeable among the people of the book are hearing it and making sure that others don't hear it because if they hear it, they might get influenced. He's meeting you know, objection and criticism at every step of the way because of what he's calling them to. And Allah says, no, because of this, you still keep on inviting. Why? Why? Because something will emerge eventually. You see, there's a, the analogy I'd like to give you is that the, you know, people that don't have a deep root, deeply rooted values, and their only objective is something weak that will disappear, like money and power will come, and money and power will eventually go, right? If that's their objective, then where they stand today is not where they will be standing tomorrow. And if you look at their track record 20 years ago, they were not standing in the same place. You go further back, they were somewhere else, now they're somewhere else, now they're somewhere else. Their, their definition of right and wrong, their definition of how to move forward, their definition for what they're calling their nation to, all of it keeps changing because their objectives are always moving. Their targets are always moving. Rasulullah is being told to anchor himself in the word of Allah that doesn't change because of the political climate. It doesn't change because of economic conditions. It doesn't change because of social conditions. It is a constant. It stays in place. It's It stands upright. It stays in place. So these people are going to move this way, that way, and the other way, and you're going to stand tall exactly where you were. And then the, the climate will change, and it will be harder for you to say what you're saying, and you will still say exactly what you were saying before. You will stay consistent on message. You're not going to budge from your position. And when that happens... Believe it or not, eventually people that are looking for guidance here, there, 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 there's always some people, maybe not the most powerful people, maybe people that nobody knows about, that are looking for the truth. And every time they look for the truth here, it keeps moving. And they look for the truth there, and it keeps moving. But the one that's calling to the same thing consistently, and he's, he hasn't budged his values. And, and when you listen to his call, then it makes complete sense. Through all of the noise, it still makes sense. Allah will decide that some people will somehow come through the most corrupt society and they will start accepting this message. Even though they don't look like billionaires to you, they don't look like celebrities to you, but they will start accepting this message only because you're calling. We don't measure the, the power of the invitation to Allah's word 
We don't measure it by how many influential people became Muslim. You know, Muslims get really excited. They're like, oh, you know who's Muslim? Muhammad, Muhammad Ali is Muslim. And you know who else might be Muslim? I think Michael Jackson took Shahada before he died. And you know who else is Muslim? Obama might be a Muslim. I mean, we got like a list of celebrities that are Muslim. We're like, yeah. Because when celebrities become Muslim, then somehow Islam will become powerful. Was Bilal a celebrity? Radiallahu anhu? Was he, was, you know? The, 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 the Sahaba that we talk about, and even Umar bin al-Khattab, an influential person, was he a leader of the Quraysh? Was he in charge? No. No, he wasn't. The most powerful people in Quraysh actually didn't accept. And you know what? What did Allah do? Allah took people that you would never imagine to be the, the pillars of history. And He made them. Today, we celebrate their names because they, they made a mark on this earth like nobody else. Kings have come and gone and we don't remember their names. Empires have come and gone and nobody cares and, or knows about them. Palaces have been built and you don't even know who built it. You know, those people come and go. And then you have these followers of the Prophet wasallam who did not build palaces, who did not have mansions, who did, who did not, you know, they don't, people don't remember them as the governor of this city or the president of that nation or the king of, but what they did, what they did still left a mark on people till, till this day. Till this day. We don't know who is going to change history. We don't know. We don't know which child that's sitting around playing in a masjid today is going to be a leader, going to be an influencer that is going to change the course of history for millions of people in 10 years from now. We don't know that. There's no way for us to know that. What did Allah tell His Prophet Sallallahu He told us, He told him, Fadru. Just keep calling. You just keep calling. These obstacles will be there. It will look like there are, because we go by trends now, right? Everything is trending this way or trending that way. Look at the trend. Look at what all these people are saying. Look at what all these influencers are doing. Look at what's happening in this country. Look at the policies that are changing. Look at how many millions of views on this video or that video. All we look at is trends and numbers and numbers and numbers. That's all we gauge power on, influence on. And Allah is shattering that and telling His Messenger, Sallallahu you know, just إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُوا مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرَ وَخَشِيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ You're just here to warn somebody who will follow the reminder and end up being fearful of a Rahman in the hidden. Meaning, you people might, might not, never even know who that is. And they end up following a Rahman. They end up following him. So for that reason, just keep on calling. Stay consistent. Stay on message. Don't let your this, this word... Something else superimpose itself on the word of Allah. The word of Allah can speak for itself. Nothing else gets to impose, impose itself on the word of Allah. And that's the first solution the Prophet ﷺ was given. You were chosen because you'll keep on inviting and calling out. And what that teaches us as I leave you for today's khutbah is that we have to be vocal about what our book says. We have to be vocal about it. We have to call people to... Because our book is being misrepresented all the time. If your, if your mother was being misrepresented, you'd say something about it. If your father was being misrepresented, you'd say something about it. If your child was being misrepresented, you'd say something about it. If you were being misrepresented, you'd say something about it. No, that's not what I said. I never did that. You'd speak about who you really are. And here we have our dearest book, the Quran, being misrepresented every single day. And we, we're not calling people to what it actually says. There's enough of us on this earth to spend a little bit of time, spend a little bit of energy in understanding what Allah is actually saying. Even Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, anni walaw ayah. Communicate on my behalf even if it's a single ayah. Speak up for what Allah says. Speak up for what it says. And how can you speak up for what it says if you aren't and I'm not spending any time trying to understand what it says? If we don't have the time or energy or enthusiasm, enthusiasm to acquire what Allah is saying, how are we going to carry on that legacy of the Prophet Fadru? So what is Allah telling us? Look at all those challenges that were there. And they, those challenges sound exactly like today's challenges, don't they? People who already know better and are still corrupt. Religious groups that are fighting among each other for power and dominance. Others that, that the only God they truly worship that are in political positions of power, the only thing they're interested in is money, status, and, and, and power. That's it. These are the same obstacles from before. And in the solution of them, Allah, as a solution for them, Allah sent this ummah, Allah sent you, Allah sent me. He, put, he chose us in this ummah to be the followers of Muhammad Rasulullah So we could, we could be carrying falidhalika fadru. And because of that, you must invite. You must speak up. You must represent your book. 
you know, where everybody else is worried about this rights or that rights or those rights. We're worried about the rights of Allah's book. Allah's book has rights over us, right? It has rights over us and we have to stand up for that. So we'll, we'll, we'll pause here inshallah and we'll go through this ayah little by little so we understand how and we, we get to really stop and think about what is it that Allah is telling His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in this ayah and through him what is he telling the rest of us. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.